Uh, Adam, thank you so much for being on the program. It's a real honor. Um, My pleasure. We're a couple of Midwest boys, so That's right. uh, we both uh, we both grew up on Sven Gulli. My hero. Yeah, I, when I saw him in Wadzilla, I was like, "Oh shit, that's Rich Coes." That's right, the uh, great Rich Coes. So I fully expect you to be the one that directs his uh, uh, his uh, biopic. That's actually a great idea, and when I do, I will give you a big thank you. Thank, and that's all I ask. Um, so now I just saw Director's Cut last night. And uh, I'm I'm going to be doing a review of it later, but whoops! Uh oh, hold on! I dropped my phone. I dropped my phone. This is what you get when you do live TV, folks. Sorry. All right. <laughs> okay, so I'm I watched it last night, and I'm going to be doing a review of it soon. But the thing about it is, is it's I almost and this is a good thing. I almost think it's unreviewable because you can't you can't <laughs> review it without spoiling everything. Well, I take that as a uh, as a compliment. Thank you for saying that. Um, we wanted to make a movie that was different than a movie that most people have seen. So if if you find yourself uh, at a loss for how to how to review it without giving everything away, then I think we did some semblance of our job. I th- I mean it, it 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 breaks down all the barriers of of filmmaking in general. Um, it just kind of and it, and it, people who don't who think they know about making movies when they watch this, they're gonna be like, oh, 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 okay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that makes sense. Um, now this was filmed a long time ago. Like, well, I mean, c- considerably speaking, it's like what September of 2014. We shot it then, and it premiered. Uh, it opened the 2016 Slam Dance Film Festival. Now, since then, Penn has lost a considerable amount of weight. Yeah, when yeah, he wa- about, when he about, goes back and watches me, this, about me um, my, me's worth of weight he's lost. <laughs> When he goes back and watches it, does he kind of like go, "Oh God"? No, he 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 loves it because he says that he deserves an Oscar for having gained 150 pounds for the role. He there said most go. people who gain weight for a role they do it real fast. He said he's been gaining weight for this role over 30 years, <laughs> and that's why he absolutely deserves the Oscar. <laughs> now, when because I know he wrote the script, did he approach you, or is this something that you kind of? saw that you were you were given and you decided that you know maybe i should be uh directing this no he approached me i had directed a movie called look oh yeah came out about 10 years ago Great and film. uh just a little bit before he and i teamed up he had seen the movie look uh a friend of his had shown it to him and he liked it so he this was on a friday night he called his manager and his agents and he said You've got to find me the guy who directed Look, Adam Rifkin. I need to talk to him about that movie. So they said, we'll get on it first thing Monday morning. So he wasn't satisfied with that. So he found me on Facebook that night. And he realized we had some mutual friends. So he wrote me a private message. And he said some more complimentary things about the movie. Uh, And he left his phone number. And because it was late Friday night, of course, I was home because I have no life. So I got the message. And I didn't want to call him late at night on a Friday night and be rude. So I wrote him back and I said, thank you so much for uh, the kind words. I'm a big fan of yours as well. Here's my number. Call me anytime over the weekend. And as soon as I hit send, two seconds later, my phone rang and it was Penn. And he was uh, very, very nice about Look. He really liked Look. And he said because of Look, he felt that I should direct this movie he's been writing called director's cut and he told me a little bit about it you know i'm just gonna hold on a second as i talk i'm gonna the lighting is a little bit less harsh maybe if i how's that is that, that better I, I, you you can use this in your you're in a your you're, piece, a, you're a visionary of skype interviews sir i'm uh I, that that harsh sunlight on my on my mouth was kind of distracting to this, me anyway I don't this know will go this will go into the criterion edition of the interviews you know what? I'm sitting in my car, as you know. This is a quiet. This is the quietest spot I can find. What I'm going to do? I'm going to have my seat go all the way back. Like oh, I'm that's the perfect. Shop. There you go. How's that? All right. There now we're now we're cooking with yes. gas. All right. So it's a little bright still. Hold on. Sorry. I thought we were in good shape. <laughs> this, this is this is great. This is fun. All right. This is good. Okay. I'll keep I'll keep it up like this. Okay. okay. So yeah. there's there's the lens. There okay. So as uh, I was saying. What was I saying? You were saying that uh, Penn s- sought you out to direct. Right, right, right. Show. So he told me about Look. Excuse me. 
he told me about director's cut. And uh, I said to him, he said, would you, would you direct it? I said, I, I generally prefer to direct what I've written, but it sounds interesting. I'd love to read it. And of course, I'll read it with a very open mind. So uh, he emailed it to me right then. I read it immediately. By three o'clock in the morning, we were back on the phone. And I said to him, I can't say no, because this is such a unique opportunity as a filmmaker to get to play in this space. It's a movie that I've never seen before. And I seek out unusual films. And I have my whole life. I said, this is a film I have never seen before. And as a filmmaker, it gives me an opportunity to do some pretty fun stuff that most people don't get a chance to do. First of all, you get to make two movies in one. Yeah. You get to make a slick B thriller that basically is a ripoff of seven. <laughs> and you get to make a, an amateur psycho weirdo shot in a basement with a camcorder freak show of a movie and somehow figure out how to mash them together into this bizarre fan edit called Director's Cut. I said, how could I say no to that? So we, we, uh, we were very happy that we were in business together, but we immediately realized this is going to be an impossible movie to get funded. So sometime later, it was Penn who suggested we crowdfund it, and that's what we did. And I love that fact that, that, that the crowdfunding was actually, actually played into the, the, the script. Um, with the whole, thank like, you. Yeah, that was, that, that was, was actually, so many people actually, don't understand crowdfunding and what, what if filmmakers have to give up in order to get their, uh, their funding, uh, for their films, like having him on set filming. It's like, oh yeah, he kind of, <laughs> yeah, he's gotta be here. <laughs> well, you know, in the original script, crowdfunding was not a part of the plot and it wasn't until we started crowdfunding that Penn actually wrote the crowdfunding, uh, aspect into the story. And when you look at the movie now, you can't really separate the movie from the crowdfunding aspect. It, it's so ingrained in the narrative. You can't even imagine that it could have not, it could have existed without the crowdfunding, but, uh, it was, it, it just was woven in so effectively by Penn. Yeah. And, and the performances were all great. I mean, I, it, it, it I saw Mr. LA law for, for the first time and I don't know how ever, you know, cause I don't <laughs> yeah. watch reality TV, so I don't see him on the, right. you know, um, and, uh, it's just, uh, I didn't realize, um, cause you, there's certain actors and actresses you look at and you're like, you kind of dismiss them as, yeah. as, as, as day players like Missy Pyle. I totally dismissed her and I saw her in this, I'm like, Oh my God, she's amazing. Yeah, but she's amazing. for my money, the scene that stole the movie, and this isn't a spoiler, um, was Teller's scene in the interrogation room. Teller is a brilliant actor, and people have never heard him speak. So to hear him give that big monologue, yeah, uh, is a is a shock. But he's a great actor, and he's a he's a really great guy too. But he he his performance, he was so committed, and he was so as you I think you'll agree, he's so creepy in that role. Oh yes, I mean if if this movie wasn't a weirdo wacko black comedy, if we were actually doing a, a thriller, and we cast Teller as the sort of creepy red herring character. You'd buy it. Oh, definitely. You'd completely buy it. Oh, yeah, there's uh, definitely, there's that. He actually reminds me uh, of an episode of Law & Order Special Victims Unit where this guy's, like, doing copycat killing. And he's got oh, okay, he's got cool. the big glasses, and he's, like, the uh -huh. kind of mousy-ish kind of thing, except, well, tell her is that whole, you got to see the movie, people. Just go, <laughs> oh, my God. Uh, it's, it's and, and just so everybody knows, it, it's a hit's VOD on the 12th. Of June, and uh, when is there? A, is there a... actually? It's on VOD now. Oh, it's on VOD and it now, hits, okay. and it has Blu-ray the twelfth of June. Okay, so then I have to go to Best Buy. Okay, good. That makes that makes sense because I I've seen the film, but I have to buy it. It's just, and I'm sure this is your this is this is an Adam Rifkin film, so I'm sure it's loaded with special features. It is. This is the this film is packed with more special features than ever anything I've ever been a part of, and that is solely because the. Uh, Folks, the good folks at Dread Central Presents, which is a division of Epic Pictures, they are so committed to making fabulous product. So it is a loaded disc. Well, yeah, you've well, you've got some people like Rob Galuzzo over there who uh, live and breathe like Scream Factory and Arrow and those people, exactly. and they put out all. You know, it's, it's they take so much of my money. Uh, it's bad, but but I'm, so I, I, that's definitely something that everybody, if, you know, watch it on VOD, then go buy the Blu-ray and DVD on Tuesday. Yes, please, please, please listen to this man. Yeah, see, I speak truth, um, and uh, it's such an amazing film. But I, there's another film, a couple of films of yours I want to talk about. First off, I want to say that I think you're one of the most versatile filmmakers out there because you went from making The Chase 
with right. one of the most illogical sex scenes ever <laughs> to Last Movie Star, which um, I think is arguably one of the best movies in the last couple of years. I think. Well, thank you very much. I, I think appreciate Bert, you Bert that. put thank on a, a clinic. And uh, the question I have about that film is why uh, now A twenty four put that out right? That's right. Okay, did, they did, were they the ones that suggested the change from Dog Years to Last Movie Star? They were, and I, and we agreed with them actually. What was that? What was their reasoning behind it? The film played film festivals as Dog Years. That was the original title, but they felt when they bought it, they they suggested the that we be open to changing the title, and we said we were, and they and they came up with that title, and they said that the title of Dog Years they felt. You had to have seen the movie to understand what the title meant, yeah. whereas uh, Last Movie Star, you understand the movie before you've seen the movie. And I, and I don't disagree with them on that. They said Dog Years could be interpreted as a kid's movie about a dog. Um, it it uh, could be interpreted in any number of ways. Uh, and then after you see the movie, you understand that it's a it's a, you know it's it's used in reference to the passage of time and growing old, but. Um, they want to sell. They wanted to have a title that would sell the movie first, and I, I totally was fine with that. And I thought that the title of the last movie star fit perfectly. Uh, now, uh, there, I remember hearing a story. I think you were on. I think you were on Shockwaves, and you were talking. I was, about, and you were talking about getting Bert uh, uh, to be part of the picture. Now, what was the process with that? Because I know, if I remember correctly, you said you couldn't do this picture without him. I, it's not that I couldn't. I wouldn't do it without him. I wrote. Uh, the last movie star specifically for Burt Reynolds. When I was growing up in Chicago, uh, Burt Reynolds was my idol. And uh, I just thought he was the coolest guy. He was the biggest movie star in the world when I was a kid. And I just thought getting to know him and getting to work with him would, it, would just seemed like it would be the most fun thing in the world. He, he seemed like he loved being famous more than anybody else I'd ever seen. And he m made it look like it was really fun. Uh, so anyway, years later, I thought to myself, you know, I still love Burt Reynolds. I still think he's got it, even though he's not being given all the opportunities I think he deserves at this juncture. Right. So I said, I'm going to write Burt Reynolds a role that I, I hope he can't resist because I want to work with Burt Reynolds and I want to give him a role that reminds everybody what a great actor he is. Because I always felt, too, he got short, short changed as an actor because his movie star persona was so larger than life people missed the, the the subtleties of his act so i wrote this movie about this old man who used to be a famous movie star but now is you know uh, realizing his glory days are in his rearview mirror and has to sort of deal with that and, and i sent it to his manager and i said please and i'd never met burt reynolds but i said please tell burt that if he doesn't want to do this movie i'm not making it i wrote it only for burt and if burt doesn't want to be a part of it i'm not going to be a part of it so he said, uh, well, I mean, I'll send it to him, but I can't promise you what Bert will say. I mean, Bert does what Bert does. <laughs> so he sent it to Bert, and I will tell you, the next day, Bert Reynolds called me. Oh, see, that's phone. awesome. That's awesome. Yeah, and I never get starstruck. I've worked with famous people before, and I've known famous people before, and, you know, big deal. But when, when I recognized Bert Reynolds' voice on the phone, I completely digressed to the 11 year old that first saw Smokey and the Bandit and was doing backflips in my brain. I mean, I couldn't believe it was actually him. And he said that he uh, loved the script and that he was in. And that was a that's great moment. That's, that's amazing. Um, now, when it comes to like things like Last Movie Star and The Chase and Director's Cut and Wadzilla... <laughs> um, you've also it, this is where I think you're probably one of the most versatile people in the business because you also did Mouse Hunt you wrote Mouse Hunt yeah and Underdog yes and now what what kind of like how, did you, how do you have to change your mindset at all to work between the two different kinds of well of, I'll you know tell I mean? you this I like all kinds of stories I like storytelling that's why I like movies I like big movies and small movies and kid movies and grown up movies and scary movies and funny movies. I like telling all kinds of stories. Now pursuing a movie career in Hollywood, a movie making career in Hollywood is, is hard pursuing a movie making career in Hollywood. When you want to tell all different kinds of stories makes it even harder. It has definitely hurt my career to be versatile as they say. Um, if you do one thing and do it well and people know you as that brand, if you're the comedy guy or you're the gangster movie guy or you're the horror movie guy, 
it is much easier to succeed in Hollywood because the people who hire people, they know what to expect from you and they know that they're going to get their money's worth if we're going to give this comedy guy, you know, we're, we, we want to make a comedy. Let's give it to this guy who we know who does comedies well. Right. So the fact that I'm all over the map has definitely m- not made it easy on myself. But I can't help it. I can't do it any other way. Right. No, I totally, I totally get that. I've made uh, a bunch of like horror shorts and stuff, and uh-huh. I just, I, I, I have other st- stories that I want to tell. But yeah. I feel like because there's been a lot of press around the stuff that I've done in the horror world. It would be hard to kind of be like, oh well, he's right. doing he's doing a comedy. What? what right, you, you right, know? right. Although I think horror and comedy kind of have, uh, uh, um, you know, they they give people the same reactions in a different in different ways. It's true. You know, so I don't see why people get so weird about that. But I never understood it either. Some of my favorite filmmakers are very versatile filmmakers. I mean, John Huston, very versatile filmmaker. Billy Wilder, a very versatile filmmaker, you know, uh, uh, lots of others. Uh, these are the guys that I, I admire all the filmmakers who have made all the movies that I love. You know, there are plenty of filmmakers who do one thing, do it well, and they're they're gods to me, you know. But it's not like there isn't space for versatile filmmakers in Hollywood. It just makes it harder. Right, right, right. Well, it's like with Romero. He makes Night of the Living Dead. And then immediately he's pegged as a horror guy. And then he tries yeah. to make something like There's Always Vanilla. And yeah. like, what? What's this? What? Yeah, no. Yeah. Uh-uh, no. Well, Wes Craven, when he was alive, used to talk about that a lot, that he was pegged as a horror guy only. And every time he would try to move outside of the horror genre, he was not met with open arms, you know? Oh, you mean like Swamp Thing? <laughs> I was thinking more the the, the the Meryl Streep movie. I forget the name of it. Uh, we'll go with Swamp Thing. I okay. just, I, I just, uh, I, I, I can't, I can't see that as a horror picture. It's Swamp Thing. No, yeah, it's not. It's no, not. Um, but uh, that was pretty. But it's, still, yeah. but it's still a genre picture. Very true. So, so it fits still in with, in terms of the powers that be. Yeah. It still fits in with why they let him do it. You know yeah, what I mean? makes sense. Does make sense. Um, now you, uh, we, we talked about uh, uh, Sven Gulli before we started recording. Yes, uh, love Sven Gulli. I'm in Racine, Wisconsin. You're from Chicago, so we yes. both get, you know, uh, WFLD. Um, yes. Now, growing up, how much of an influence was he on you? Huge influence. Sven Gulli, for people who don't know, is the last horror show host out there working today. When, when uh, television was young and all the way through the 70s and into the early 80s, uh, all the local, te- you know, in, in the glory days of local television, which doesn't really seem to exist much anymore, uh, all the local markets had a local horror show host. So New York had Zachary, L.A. had Elvira and uh, a Vampira before her, and Chicago, in, in Boston, Simon Sanctorum, and in Chicago, it was Sven Gulli. And so basically the idea is they'd show a horror movie on Saturday night or whenever it's scheduled, and do an intro, and then in between the commercial breaks, do funny shtick and trivia about the movie and stuff like that. And I grew up loving Sven Gulli. I still do. I, you know, he's coast to coast now. Oh, yeah, I, I, watch him. I try to watch him every week. Me too. So um, it was Sven Gulli. Not only was he very influential to me on uh, in the field of comedy writing, because he's a really funny comedy writer, and he does all his own writing himself, uh, but the movies that I saw watching Sven Gulli, I saw all the universal monster movies. I saw all the hammer horror films. I saw all the AIP drive-in films. I saw all the Japanese giant monster movies. I saw everything on Sven Gulli. So I got more of a movie education from Sven Gulli than any other single source. So huge influence. That's the thing about him though, is like when he um, first showed up as son of Sven Gulli, and then he was showing he was showing actual like normal horror films like Universal Hammer all that kind yeah. of stuff. Yeah. Then he gets um, I, I I like to say he went on a hiatus. I don't like to say he got canceled. Um, right, right. But he went on his hiatus. Then when he came back at WICU, he started doing like more like oh well here's like he did the people under the stairs and stuff like that. And it's like right. oh yeah. shit okay. But now that he's on yeah. me TV, it seems to be exclusively like you know uh, stuff that you can sit down with your family. 
uh, yeah. and watch, which is fine yeah. because his because sure. the, the the community on Twitter during his perform during his show is is ridiculous, and you meet so many cool people. And oh, good. I'm a, I'm a I'm a big like do everything myself type person. Yeah. And watching him and realizing he wrote all this stuff and he had to sit down and find out and it's it just such it's such a huge thing, and it's great to also see that you and he are both from the Midwest and that just proves to people that you don't have to be from California or, or New York or anything like that to make it. In in the it's business. true, it's a hundred percent true, and uh, you know it, it, as I uh, have become a a filmmaker, I've I've gotten to be friendly with Rich. And he's a great guy, just like I always hoped he'd be. And uh, you, you also cast. Now, <laughs> he's kind of got a, in a weird way, he's kind of got a family friendly vibe to him. Sure. Um, what was his reaction when you offered him the part in Wa- a movie called Wadzilla? He was totally great. I mean, I said, I, I sent him the script. Mm-hmm. I said, I needed a newscaster who was announcing that a giant sperm was attacking the city <laughs> uh, in the same style as like a 1950s B sci-fi, you know, you know, giant monster attacking right. in New York kind of movie. And I said, at, so I said, the movie is uh, a giant sperm is attacking a b- giant sperm cells attacking New York. Here's the basic script of what the newscaster says, but I need you to inject into it. Those great Sven puns that you do so well. And he just completely embraced it and gave me all these hilarious puns that were applicable to the subject and uh they were very all very double entendre esque they were hilarious they're in the movie so definitely pick up a copy of chillerama if you haven't for for wadzilla alone that movie is just oh <laughs> and you were you were great in it sir <laughs> thank you thank you that, thank that was, you uh... I, I do not consider myself an actor but i will occasionally ham it up and uh, that is one where i definitely hammed it up and it was and it was amazing. That was that was a big sperm. That was huge. <laughs> um, so now you let's get back to a director's cut. Is going to be in Blu-ray and DVD. Uh, is it going to be at all box stores, or is it just going to be kind of a? I don't know what the distribution <coughs> plan is in terms of what stores it's going to be available in. I know that um, you can currently pre-order it right now on the Epic Pictures website. Okay. Uh, and I know that it will be available in stores. I just don't know which ones, uh, or you'll be able to get it online, you know, on Amazon and stuff too. Right. So check your check websites, people. Google is your friend, or you can get it right now on VOD. And I suggest doing that and getting the DVD in the Blu-ray. Uh, and it, it, just tell your friends. It's an, it's an amazing picture. Uh, I don't know how long my review is going to be. Like thirty seconds. I can't. I can't. <laughs> it, just go see it. You know. But. Uh, uh, that and director's cut and hereditary. You can't review them without spoiling everything. So it's, yeah, it's one of those kind of things. Definitely. So check them out. And then also uh, last movie star is available uh, pretty much everywhere. Uh, it's on- available on all the streaming sites. It's available on Amazon prime right now. Oh, there you go. Uh, so that's good. It's also available on Blu-ray. So go pick that up. If you want to, if you want to see Burt Reynolds, just knock it out of the park. Which is what he does, and my one of my favorite parts of that movie, without spoiling too much, is like when he has conversations with himself. Thank you. I I, I felt that that was um, a good way to express visually uh, the idea of time passing and how quickly it goes by. Because I wanted to see Bert in his glory and Bert today interacting with one another, and and be able to see that this is the same person, and not that much time has gone by. But look what time does to us all you know yeah it really yeah yeah it was uh and it was it was a little it took me a few minutes to get used to aerial winter with a noah's ring and not wearing glasses and being uh, uh kind of a nerd <laughs> right but it, it, it all worked out uh so adam i want to thank you so much for being on uh i, I go thank out you. and pick up these movies and go go pick up a copy of the chase just because it was charlie sheen before things went wrong yeah <laughs> <laughs> I guess is the best, and plus Christy Swanson's in it. So I mean, how can you go wrong? It's Buffy. She, she's great. They're she both is. great. Yes, and then uh, now your Twitter is just at Adam Rifkin, or is there at Adam Rifkin? All right, and, uh, and also my Instagram is at underscore Adam Rifkin. There you go. Follow him on all that social media jazz. Go pick up the movies, Adam. Thank you so much for being on. Thank you so much. I appreciate all the kind words, and I appreciate uh, you having me on.